Hello and welcome to this high-level panel discussion at the Paris Peace Forum. We are very pleased that you're joining us from wherever in the world you are. My name is Anne Soy. I'm a correspondent and deputy Africa editor for the BBC based in Nairobi. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we do things, including this very session. The European Union has been tackling the pandemic at different scales. And over the next 40 or so minutes, we will be discussing the Team Europe response to COVID-19, controlling this pandemic and preventing the next one. We'll discuss health security, global, regional and national partnerships and lessons learned to prevent and respond to the next pandemic. Now, we're joined by a great lineup of distinguished panelists, leaders in public health on the global stage and in Europe and Africa. We welcome your questions. Please send them to the chat session, uh, section uh, and please let us know who among the panelists you are directing it to. But before our discussion, I would like to welcome Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me? Yes, please continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Jutta Ulpilainen, Your Excellency Norbert Bartle, Your Excellency Amira El Fadil, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, thank you for the opportunity of addressing you today. WHO is deeply grateful to Team Europe for its strong support for WHO and for multilateralism throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 50 million cases of COVID-19 have now been reported to WHO with over 1.2 million deaths. Although data are scarce, millions more may have died due to disruption of essential services. As I said at the World Health Assembly this week, we may be tired of COVID-19, but it's not tired of us. Here in Europe, countries are now struggling to cope with a fresh wave of infections and deaths. But the virus itself has not changed significantly and nor have the measures needed to stop it. We know what works. First, know your epidemic and do the basics well. Find, isolate, test and care for cases, trace and quarantine their contacts. And second, engage and empower communities to protect themselves and others with the full range of measures, physical distance, avoiding crowds, ventilation, hand hygiene and masks. Of course, a vaccine is needed urgently, but we cannot simply wait for a vaccine and we cannot put all our eggs in one basket. At the first encouraging result of vaccine trials arrive, the world is approaching a decisive moment. Will countries share the fruits of science with those who need it most or will the poorest and most vulnerable miss out? We very much appreciate the leadership of Team Europe to ensure that doesn't happen. Together, we have already delivered critical supplies, technical advice, training, and surge capacity to countries with weaker health systems, including in Eastern Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. But even as we supported countries with evidence-based tools, we also knew that we would need new tools to truly bring the pandemic under control and that those tools must be accessible to all countries equitably. That's why WHO proposed the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, a unique mechanism with two aims, to develop vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics fast and to allocate them fairly. WHO is very grateful to France, Germany, and the European Commission for their support in establishing the ACT Accelerator to ensure these life-saving tools are allocated fairly as global public goods, not as private commodities. We're all in this together, and we can only truly get out of it together. The pandemic is a reminder that international cooperation 
is the only option in the face of an international crisis. COVID-19 has strained the multilateral system, but it has not broken it. On the contrary, it has shown why it's so important and why it must be strengthened. In that regard, we welcome the recent EU Council conclusions calling for the strengthening of WHO as the leading and coordinating authority in addressing global health challenges. Today, I would like to suggest three fundamental shifts that WHO believes all countries must make. First, invest in public health. Many countries have made huge investments and advances in medicine, but too many have neglected their basic public health systems, which are the bedrock of, for preventing, preparing for, detecting, and responding to outbreaks. Second, a One Health approach uh, is important. The pandemic has highlighted the intimate links between the health of humans, animals, and planet, which we can only address with a One Health approach. Any efforts to improve health are doomed unless they address these critical interfaces and the threat of climate change. Third, go beyond the health sector. We will not prevent the next pandemic by focusing only on strengthening health systems. The pandemic has affected every sector, so it stands to reason that every sector must be involved in the recovery and in preparedness. Just as the pandemic requires an all of government, all of society response, so does promoting and pro protecting health. We need to build mutual trust and accountability for health by bringing nations and partners together to support the whole of government approach to strengthening national capacities for pandemic preparedness, universal health coverage, and healthier populations. Invest in public health, take a One Health approach, and go beyond the health sector. These are the fundamental shifts I believe our world must make, both to safeguard against future health emergencies and to promote and protect the health of everyone, everywhere. I thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for that powerful um, opening remarks. And indeed, multilateralism is what we're talking about uh, today and how it has come into play during uh, this pandemic. Um, we would like to now go into the discussion part of this uh, session, and I would like to welcome Commissioner Yuta Ochdilainen, Commissioner for the International Partnerships at the European Commission. And we're also joined by uh, Commissioner for Social Affairs at the Africa Union Commission, Her Excellency Amira Mohamed El Fadil. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. And just picking up uh, from that uh, speech from Dr. Tedros, uh, Commissioner Uthilainen, uh, just give us a sense of um, the e how the EU um, has been putting multilateralism at the center of its response. Could you tell us more about this response and how it was organized by the EU? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, let me start by, by uh, saying that I'm very, very happy to share this panel today with other leading actors in the global response to COVID-19. And uh, like the Dr. Tetros just said, only together we can bring this pandemic to an end. The EU has been committed to response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic through a strong multilateral response at different scales. Uh, we did this as Team Europe. We combined our financial resources to make a bigger impact and offer tangible solidarity to partner countries around the world with our Team Europe country packages. The collective global amount of the EU, member states and the EIB and the EBRD re reaches almost 37 billion euros to support partner countries to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. We have also supported 
several actions at the global level. Through the ACT Accelerator, a strong collaborative framework was set for researchers, companies, regulators, foundations and other act actors working together at the global level to develop the new solutions that we need both for vaccines, for therapeutics and diagnostics, while strengthening health systems. We have hosted the Coronavirus Global Response Conference, which has allowed raising close to 16 billion euros to ensure the universal and equitable access to prevention, diagnostic and treatment against COVID-19 when available. And we are currently focusing our efforts to ensure a universal access to the future vaccine to partner countries, both through the EU uh, vaccine strategy and through our engagement with Gavi and the COVAX facility, to which we have already contributed 400 million euros in guarantees. And I'm very pleased, dear friends, to announce today further 100 million euros in grants. The EU is demonstrating we are serious about our commitments to leave no one behind and make the COVID-19 vaccine a global public good. So this is what we have been doing and what we are currently doing uh, in order to fight COVID-19. Indeed, a massive effort there uh, spearheaded by, among others, the World Health Organization, bringing countries together uh, to work towards having a unified distribution approach for vaccines. And turning to you, um, uh, Commissioner Amira, the EU-Africa relations, where do you see um, that, um, how, how do you see that evolving and where is the place of health in that relationship? Thank you very much, Anne, and it's my pleasure uh, to join uh, Dr. Tedros and also Commissioner Jota uh, in this uh, forum. Um, and we are still fighting this pandemic uh, globally and in Africa. Uh, between the African Union and the European Union, there is a strategic partnership and there is a specific mechanisms for this partnership. But this pandemic, it's a global pandemic, and this COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call for the importance of multilateralism. Because we started fighting it in Africa, it started somewhere in Asia, it's all over the world, it's in Europe, it's in America, it's in Africa. And what is learned from the beginning that this pandemic has no borders, this pandemic, it needs the cooperation and it needs us to act in a multilateralism, all of us in all the continents. In Africa, from the beginning, uh, we decided that Africa will act uh, in solidarity and in unity. Africa decided from the beginning uh, through the leadership of the African Union and the African Union Commission that we will speak with one voice, we will be one in fighting this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And that's exactly what happened. We acted early. We have... Uh, approved our continental strategy, that COVID-19 continental strategy, early in February, after the first case, one week of the first case being reported in the continent. So we acted early, we acted together as the 55 member states of Africa, led by the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And from the beginning also, we had our leaders, uh, the chair of the union, President Ramaphosa, and the chair of the commission, Excellency Musafaki, they led us actually with the Bureau of the Assembly of Heads of States and Governments, who used to help uh, by weekly meetings to follow up on the implementation of this strategy. There is also very important and very successful initiatives from Africa CDC. I can just name two of them, the PAC initiative, it's for accelerating uh, the testing, but also in this initiative, we looked for partnerships because PACT is partnership for accelerating testing in Africa. We worked from the beginning 
under uh, the guidance of WHO with a very close collaboration with our regional director, Dr. Mwedi, and also because we have uh, many countries, uh, around seven uh, countries with every region, we are also working with every region, and we will working also very closely with Dr. G uh, Tedros on the Geneva level, and he's also uh, part of all our meetings from the, the beginning. I thank him for that. He's with us from the beginning, and he's supporting our efforts in Africa. We have another initiative uh, that uh, is like a campaign uh, to protect uh, lives, for saving lives and saving economies, because we know that this pandemic caused a lot of pressure on our economies. It affected people's lives, it affected uh, the jobs in Africa, with many people that lost their jobs, uh, lost their incomes, uh, staying at home, uh, children are staying at home because of the closing of the schools. Uh, many families fall in the cracks of the poverty because of this pandemic. So the the, the impact, the non-health impact of this COVID-19 is more and more than the health impact uh, that's happening to our people in Africa. So this second campaign, it's a campaign uh, we did it together uh, with our ministers of finance and our ministers of uh, that responsible about transportation. It's about how to ease lockdowns, how to have the balance uh, between implementing the measures needed uh, for the prevention from the pandemic and at the same time uh, giving people the, the, the opportunity uh, to normalize uh, their, their lives. So I think what we did in Africa uh, kept us as Africa, we are affected, but it kept us to be the least affected uh, continent in the world till today. Uh, when it comes to the infection rates, we are the least. When it comes to the fatality rates, we are still the least uh, affected uh, continent. And we hope we will continue uh, to be in this rating and even to go uh, further and to lower uh, the infections in the continent. We have established uh, a fund and the COVID-19 fund, because you know we have a uh, problem with uh, the financial resources. We have pulled our resources as a continent, but also we have extended our hand uh, to our partners in the European Union. I thank very much the European Union for the technical and financial support being given to us through the Africa CDC. I thank very much many countries in the European Union, like Germany, uh, they led on uh, supporting us with um, the works of 10 million uh, equipment, uh, PPEs and masks and uh, all the equipment needed for fight, the fight of uh, testing kits for the fight of COVID-19. And many countries within the European Union and the European Commission, they supported Africa. We have received also support from other international organizations. And I don't need to mention uh, WHO because WHO is always uh, supporting us. Also, we have uh, established a medical supplies platform. It's an electronic platform also for pool procurement uh, for the needed equipment for the continent. These are some of the efforts we have exerted here in Africa, but I can go back to your question by saying that this uh, cooperation between Africa and Europe needs to continue. We need to work more in strengthening our health systems in Africa. We need Africa CDC and Europe CDC to even to collaborate more. They are collaborating right now. They are exchanging information. We have uh, also experts from uh, the uh, Europe CDC working with us, but we need to make sure that this cooperation will continue till we are free from this pandemic and even after this pandemic, we need to continue this close collaboration. We need to activate all the aspects of the multilateralism to fight the pandemics in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Amira Mohamed El Fadil. Uh, indeed, many lessons are coming from this. Uh, this pandemic. And uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, I would just like to put this question to you as we shift this discussion to the lessons learned and um, how they can be used to prevent and deal with future pandemics. From where you sit, um, how can uh, the lessons learned from this pandemic now be, be used to strengthen health systems uh, to curb and prevent the next one? I think I have colleagues on, on the line and I was waiting until Commissioner Amira finished to go to another meeting. So if you don't mind, I would be happy if my colleagues could uh, respond. I have uh, other colleagues who are on the line now. Indeed, but, yeah, that's but, right. Uh, I, 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 I,
uh, been waiting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Yes, we understand. And I, I, my colleagues will respond. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, very happy to join you today. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for your time, Dr. Tedros. So but but we need and we need Dr. Tedros for the vaccines. <laughs> we Indeed, need. this conversation will continue even beyond this session. Issues. Offline, okay. not online. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we will be joined by uh, very shortly by uh, well, as Dr. Tedros said, uh, one of the WHO uh, uh, one of the officials from the World Health Organization. And if I could just put this question to Commissioner uh, Yuki Leinen, um, in terms of the lessons learned from this pandemic, um, how do you see health systems uh, being strengthened in order to curb and prevent the next one? Thanks, thanks for this uh, very, very important question. I think first we obviously have to strengthen, <clears throat> sorry, uh, strengthen uh, health systems to ensure the best preparedness and prevention to potential future epidemics and pandemics. The, this crisis has revealed the weaknesses of our health system. So we know that, you know, what are the weaknesses, what are, the, of course, also the strengths. The COVID-19 response uh, came in addition to EU ongoing health programs supporting many partner countries. So the sustained contribution of the EU through the operations of the Global Fund, Gavi, and uh, WHO, and our support to the African Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, uh, which uh, my dear sister Amira was talking about, are a testimony of our long-standing commitment uh, to short, medium and long-term health impacts crucial in supporting partner countries to address the pandemic and strengthen their health system. So through Green Europe, we can mobilize much needed financial resources to strengthen health systems. The next MFF, multi-annual financial framework, adopted in the EU uh, this week, it offers key opportunities to build Team Europe initiatives where we will join our forces to have a, a transformational impact. And I'm strongly committed to spending at least 20% of our uh, developing cooperation resources to human development. This is my personal commitment. Because investments in health will be key in, in that, that regard. So we will invest at least 20% to human development. And of course, healthcare and health will be a crucial part of that. Second, I think this is the biggest lesson session of the crisis, uh, I think the pandemic has made evident that we are only as strong as our weakest link. We need a global recovery which is sustainable, green, digital, just and equal. And we must do this by reviving multilateralism. So we must have a strategic vision to collectively put the SDGs back on track, boost investments, have an ambitious uh, approach to debt relief, and put young people in the, the driving seat. This will reduce inequalities drastically and will ensure that our societies are resilient and prepared to face the future challenges together. So um, I would say that these two lessons uh, are the ones I have at least personally learned from the current crisis. Thank you very much, Commissioner Yupilainen. And turning to you, uh, Commissioner Amira, uh, from where you sit, what are the lessons that have been learned uh, that will inform the, um, the response to future pandemics? I think in Africa, we start learning the lessons in this field of fighting pandemics uh, since uh, the Ebola outbreak uh, in the West African countries 2014-2015. to 
because at that time our leaders um, looked into the gaps we had because one of the big gaps we had at that time that we have no uh, institution technical institution in africa to fight the pandemics and that's why the africa center for disease control and prevention was established it was the process started in 2016 immediately after the ebola uh, outbreak uh, it was ending at that time and then the, 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 the break came again that came again in 2018 in the RC. And in 2017, January, they launched this Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I think this is the biggest lesson for Africa. The Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention now is up, running, and functioning. Uh, we have uh, established five regional collaborating centers. Um, um, three of, out of the five are already functioning to our work in the prog uh, process. And I think this is the biggest lesson learned. The second lesson learned from the Ebola outbreak and the other outbreaks we have in the continent, that we need to build up uh, to strengthen our health systems in Africa. It is weak and fragile in many African countries. We need to look into uh, training and capacity building for our health workers in Africa. We need to make sure that we have the diagnostics abilities in the continent. We have uh, the, the, the capable laboratories because when this pandemic started, uh, COVID-19, we found out that it's only two countries have laboratories with the capability to diagnose COVID-19. And this was a very big weakness at the beginning. It's good that so Africa CDC, in collaboration with WHO, with our international partners, we managed to build up the capacity in the diagnostic areas, and now we have 48 uh, countries that have the capacity to diagnose. Um, by uh, the end of this year, uh, very soon, all the countries, the 55 countries, will have this capacity. So this is one of the area of weaknesses. It's a lesson learned. We are working on it. The area of surveillance, it also needs a lot of effort. So the continuation of the training and the capacity building in all areas of health uh, system, it has to continue. It's a lesson learned. We have to make sure that our public health system is uh, operational, it is strong, it can uh, fight pandemics in the continent. This is uh, some of the lesson learned. Also, we have one of the lesson learned is that um, pandemics do not affect health only, it affects all uh, aspects of our lives, it affects our political situations. It affects our economies, it affects our society, it goes down to affecting our communities, even our family uh, situations, our family that everything is affected. Because the, during this COVID-19, we have suffered uh, from a rising of uh, domestic violence, we have suffered from uh, more uh, families goes into poverty zone, we have suffered from uh, the economy is being affected. So there is many lessons learned from this pandemic, but also uh, when we look to the land, we have to look into how uh, to put solutions for the challenges, how to come together as Africa, and how to bring together as Africa with the rest of the world to overcome these challenges. Thank you. Indeed, there, there, there have been many lessons. And thank you so much to all the people following this discussion from wherever you are in the world. Thank you for the questions that you're sending. I'm going to put them now to our panelists. And we have a question from Elise Rodriguez. Um, Elise is asking, dear Commissioner Upilainen, how will the EU mainstream health into the next EU Africa strategy to ensure the sustainable support responding to COVID-19 and any future health emergencies? Thank you for that question. Um, really, we adopted a new strategy with Africa mm. just before the COVID-19 hit, <laughs> so in the beginning of, of March. And uh, through that strategy, of course, we want to strengthen our partnership with, with Africa. And um, in that strategy, we describe the, uh, five different uh, policy areas where we especially would like to strengthen the partnership. And of course, you know, uh, human development is, is part of our partnership. And as, as I said in, in my previous uh, intervention, um, our goal and commitment is 
to uh, use at least 20 percent of our development funding to human development sector. So it means that, of course, we want to strengthen the healthcare systems. We want to uh, invest more in healthcare in our partner countries, also in Africa. But uh, at the same time, I, I also liked what uh, Dr. Detro said, that we also need to look beyond the, the, the health sector. So I think, for instance, education and investing in education is, uh, is equally uh, important. If we only look at the figures, 1.6 billion students, pupils, were out of school because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So um, this week, European Parliament and the European Council were able to adopt a new multi-annual financial framework for, for the European Union. It means that in the beginning of, of next year, we start programming. So we start uh, allocating and directing our uh, developing uh, cooperation funding. And, uh, and it will be a very important, but also very um, challenging exercise. We have already, uh, pre uh, we are preparing for that, and uh, we, we have done that together with our delegations around the world, but also with our partner countries and their civil societies, but also national governments. So um, I can only say that uh, that uh, healthcare and uh, uh, strengthening the health system systems will be an important part of our future uh, programming exercise. Indeed, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. And turning to you, Commissioner Amira, this question would uh, be very fitting, especially um, given that you are from Africa. Uh, the question is from Yongi Kovacs. Um, the, the question is, now that hospitals and transportation companies are ramping up their ultra-cold chain capabilities, how do you envisage ensuring that the distribution of scarce resources, not just the vaccines, is done equitably around the world and how much focus is there on logistics when discussing vaccine distribution on the political agenda thank you very much and um, allow me just to add um, a very small thing to what uh, commissioner Jota said about the cooperation between the african union and the european uh, union commission um, health is a new area of coverage we spoke about it in the college to college meeting at the beginning at the first quarter of this year but it's a new area of, co of collaboration between the two uh, commissions uh, and this pandemic actually uh, good health issues on the focus for the two of us so we are going to expand uh, this area of cooperation we need to sit down and to discuss we are we are cooperating now but we need to sit down to discuss how are we going to cooperate more on health uh, directly because indirectly we are already uh, affecting health positively when, when uh, uh, Commissioner Jota spoke about human development, it, ha it has to do with health. When she speaks about infrastructure, it has to do with health. When we speak about uh, investing in our economies, it has to do with health. But addressing health issues directly, this is a new area. We need to work more on it. On the question of vaccines, we have developed and approved our strategy on vaccines, Africa's strategy on vaccines. And it's already been endorsed by our heads of states and government, and it's now under implementation. Our concern in Africa is accessibility to vaccines and affordability. We know that there's many uh, vaccine trials going on, there's some companies already announced that they have the vaccines ready, but we know that the countries that have um, financial resources, they will go first, they will buy first. I will feel that Africa uh, might be left behind if we are not aware enough as Africa, if we are not ready enough as Africa to negotiate and to be around the table. That's why we are negotiating with COVAX and we are speaking about the strategy. As Africa CDC decided that Africa need uh, to vaccinate and to immunize 60% of the population. For COVAX, they are talking about 20 to 25%. So we have now uh, created a task force and it's been uh, established by uh, the chair of the union, uh, President Ramaphosa, around uh, 10 days ago. 
Um, there is a strike myself from the private sector. There is uh, Professor Ronama from the African Exim Bank. Myself is a member of this task force. Uh, the director of Africa CDC and others are part of this uh, task force. This task force is a story to look into how Africa will have the enough financial resources to buy the vaccines. And we want to look into the countries that they have the ability to buy. We know that from our projections, around eight to 10 member states in Africa, they have the financial ability to buy and to access the manufacturers, but we are looking to the rest. And we decided on three sources of finance uh, already been decided, and we are working on it as a task force. We are engaging uh, this task force through the private sector. They are engaging with the manufacturers in Europe, in America, and in India. We are talking to them, we are negotiating the cost, we are negotiating uh, the tools for payments. We are also preparing uh, how the countries that have no financial ability, how will they be provided by laws uh, to um, afford by the vaccines? Of course, they are sovereign. They have to decide uh, how much to buy, how the percentage to um, unite or to vaccinate in the in the countries. This is a, a country-related decision, but we will prepare for them the projections of how much they need. Uh, for, for for vaccines, how much they need, whether it's going to be one dose or two doses, the cost, all these projections, Africa CDC is working on it now. We are also uh, engaging very much WHO with this issue of uh, accessibility and affordability of vaccines. Uh, in this area, also, we have a lesson learned uh, from uh, previous epidemics, and especially in the area of AIDS that Africa accessed uh, the, the medicine and many years after uh, the, the world got uh, these medications and we are learning from this uh, experience from the past. Our experts in Africa who were there at that time, they were with us now and they are lifting us. We need not to beat uh, the same mistake, we need to be ready and I believe we are on the right track now. We are negotiating, we will continue to negotiate with COVAX, with the World Bank, uh, with uh, other stakeholders to make sure that our countries will have the accessibility and will have the, the, the ability to buy the vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Amira. And as we come to the close of this um, panel discussion, I would just like to ask a very quick question to our commissioners. Um, given the lessons that have been learned uh, from this uh, pandemic, and you know, those of us who've been watching from Africa have really been shocked uh, to see how the health systems in more developed economies in Europe, in America, and Asia have been challenged, have been tested. Um, are you optimistic that based on the uh, lessons learned from this current pandemic, the world will be better prepared for the next one? Very briefly to you, uh, Commissioner Uthilainen. I am politi the politician and I'm optimistic. I know that through politics we can make change and that's why I'm here and I'm committed to do whatever it takes uh, to, to, to help our partner countries uh, in order to fight this COVID-19 crisis and also come from the crisis even stronger than we were before the crisis. I think that's our goal. What about you, Commissioner Amira? We have seen Africa had the advantage of time. They watched what was going on elsewhere and I think you really had no choice. You just had to work together. You had to come together and uh, confront this challenge. Are you optimistic? Very optimistic. I think it, it is doable. It is possible. And what we did since the beginning of this epidemic is telling, is telling us that it is possible and it's doable. Because when we came together, when we put our resources, when we have uh, the political win, we managed to uh, uh, mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on our continent. While we are fighting COVID-19, at the same time, we are using this crisis as an opportunity to build up our health systems. So I mean, I second what Commissioner uh, Chester said, that it is possible we will be in a better position if another epidemic or pandemic happens, we will be in a better position, we will be better prepared, our surveillance systems will be better 
prepare our prevention methods will be prepared. Uh, we will uh, be uh, more vigilant uh, to such kinds of uh, uh, pandemics or uh, epidemics. Uh, we will have a stronger health systems, better than we have now. I believe we are um, working now on building and stressing our health systems. We'll continue to do so. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, this pandemic will be a full opportunity for a fully operationalized uh, health systems in Africa. Thank you very much, Commissioner Amira Mohamed El Fadil uh, from the African Union Commission, and Commissioner Yuta um, Hupilainen uh, from the European Commission. Very excellent contributions you have made to this discussion. And thank you to everyone who was following uh, this panel discussion. Thank you for the questions that you have sent. We couldn't answer all of them, but that means that this very important conversation should not end here. Let it continue in other fora. From me, Anne Soy from here in Nairobi, thank you so much for joining us and goodbye.